Good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to uh, to talk with you all about um, AI and some issues related to uh, CT image quality. Um, one of the interesting things for me during my career in you know trying to uh, pursue uh, image quality from many perspectives <clears throat> as a researcher, as a uh, you know clinical radiologist, and as the chief of radiology, and as a researcher, um, uh, image quality has been a huge interest of mine. And as the chief of radiology, <clears throat> it's been my responsibility to optimize the delivery of care to patients um, who are undergoing imaging studies in any of our healthcare enterprises. And so, you know, there's so many things um, as the chief um, that are responsibilities, including having radiologists that have sufficient training and expertise providing timely interpretation of imaging studies. But of course, optimization of image quality is essential while trying to keep our patients as safe as possible and out of harm's way. And for radiation-based studies, as you all know, such as CT, this includes uh, using um, doses that are ALARA as uh, low as reasonably achievable. But of course, dose is not the only factor in image quality in CT. And so um, one of the questions is, well, what are the strategies? How does one optimize image quality in CT? And of course, you know, that some of the obvious ones include utilizing equipment that allows for as high a quality image as can be obtained as quickly and safely as possible. You want to use um, state-of-the-art systems when possible to um, maximize the likelihood that one has detectors that are uh, optimally sensitive with regard to uh, uh, detected quantum efficiency for radiation. You want to be able to do rapid scanning and helical scanning. Um, there are increased number of technologies that are um, available for um, dose modulation and noise reduction. Um, and uh, um, there are a number of techniques, and we'll talk about some of those that are becoming increasingly sophisticated, including those using AI for optimal image reconstruction. And so one thing that's really important is being able to um, optimize also the uh, quality of the studies that are being performed by the technologists with a continuing education. And so I think it's really important with regard to optimizing quality to create a mechanism for quality assessment and feedback. Radiologists should assess quality and provide feedback to the technologists. Um, there are a number of programs, including ours, where technologists assess their own quality and provide feedback um, to uh, other technologists. Um, there's also a importance of a feedback loop um, for information to go back to technologists to improve quality and optimize dose. And yeah, that's becoming increasingly challenging in an era where we're increasingly covering multiple hospitals and may not be on site for a large percentage of studies that we end up reading. And it's also important to uh, maintain quality control processes. And uh, one of the big challenges as we look at the question of um, image quality is, you know, is image quality really just simply in the eye of the beholder, as some might suggest, or are there actual quantitative metrics that would allow one to be able to quantify image quality beyond just whether or not the person interpreting the study um, believes it's a quality study. And so expectations for image quality can vary considerably among radiologists as, as um, we have seen in a number of different studies. And so some of the questions to be asked and answered include, does the study answer the clinical question that's being posed? Is it optimized to detect clinically important findings based on the clinical history? Is it optimized to detect incidental or any findings that might be on the image that were not um, ones that were part of the reason for the examination? Is the imaging study relatively free of noise and motion and artifacts? And is the patient positioned correctly? And does the imaging study have a familiar look um, as to what the radiologist was trained on or is currently using in clinical practice. And you know, we certainly see the vendors 
really emphasizing a particular look or feel for the um, reconstructions that they do and uh, essentially suggesting that um, there are significant advantages um, for one vendor versus another. And so many radiologists really get used to a particular look and feel or a particular um, uh, filter or kernel for, uh, for reconstruction. And then the other question is, does it utilize a post-processing technique such as edge enhancement for lung CT? So when we ask radiologists the question, uh, do you believe that this is a quality study? There are so many variables that need to be considered beyond just um, radiation dose and, and noise um, associated with the, uh, with the image. And so the whole idea of trying to assign a number or score related to quality, you know, brings up a, a large number of challenges. And if one is rating a study, does one consider some sequences better than others? Do you rate all the sequences together? How can one actually come up with a quality metric that is uh, that is quantitative? And if one does, then, you know, how does one weight the various factors associated with it? And so, you know, even if we agree that a high quality CT has certain factors such as optimal positioning, um, the data content, um, low noise, high spatial and contrast resolution, um, that you get the IV contrast and oral contrast timing correct and amount correct and lack of motion and other artifacts, you know, how in a formula um, would you rank the importance of these relative to each other? And is that a, even a possibility? And, uh, you know, the other really key question is, at what point should an imaging study be repeated as inadequate? Um, one of the things that, that we've seen in the past is that um, technologists are actually much more likely when asked and shown a CT image to suggest that it should be repeated in comparison with a radiologists. And so different radiologists and different practices may have different thresholds as to what is an adequate examination, um, even if they're pretty much perceiving the examination the same way, and as far as the criteria for repeating an examination as well. Um, in some settings, it's much easier to repeat. In other settings, it, it's much more difficult. And um, there's certainly the question about whether or not there would be value in being able to as assess an examination and do a, some sort of repeat of some portion of the study um, as soon as the study is completed. But of course, that creates challenges with regard to intravenous contrast administration and, and dose. The other question that you know, I've been particularly interested in is would it be possible to teach a computer algorithm to determine image quality based on all of these parameters and not just noise optimization? And so is there a mechanism where we could objectively come up with an algorithm to um, determine the quality of a study or maybe operationally to, to, to try and guess whether or not a group of radiologists would tend to score a particular imaging study as relatively high or relatively low. And then, of course, you know what, what I'd like to talk about is can we use advances in artificial intelligence to help optimize image quality? And so just talking about AI um, in general, uh, AI has been seen by radiologists as been as something that has been a you know, potential um, threat and also with have embraced it with a tremendous amount of excitement at the prospect of being able to increase diagnostic accuracy and potentially increase efficiency. And just as, you know, uh, I had back in 1993 when we um, created the world's first um, filmless department and made the transition from film to digital, and it was seen as sort of a Pandora's box where images now could potentially be released to anybody to do primary interpretation. And there was a thought that radiology could potentially lose control or it might take a really long time to do image interpretation. In many ways, AI has sort of been the Pandora's box of the 2020s um, with exciting promises of improved accuracy and efficiency and safety and ability to easily um, exchange information and, and potentially improve quality, 
but at the same time, there are threats that are perceived associated with AI. So when we talk about AI, I think it's really important to sort of just generally at a super high level define what we mean by AI. And so AI is in a confusing way simultaneously utilized um, in the manner that it was originally coined by computer scientist John McCarthy at Stanford in 1956, where he was really talking more about applications that a computer could run that would simulate things that would otherwise um, represent behavior that would be considered intelligent by, uh, by a human being. Much of what we're excited about in AI today and what people talk about is really related to advances in human vision and also in speech recognition um, that have emerged since uh, 2011 when um, convolutional neural networks or deep learning um, became back into vogue because we learned that we could use um, graphical processing units to be able to do image processing um, that allowed us to do these very, very computationally intensive um, calculations. And so, you know, one type of um, AI um, that we can consider is machine learning. One type of machine learning are neural networks. And uh, the subset of neural networks that have proven to be most useful for um, computer vision, um, for language translation, and most recently for um, uh, a variety of different uh, language models. Um, have been um, neural networks, convolutional um, neural networks, and also uh, transformers. And so when we talk about AI today, we're more likely talking about applications related to, uh, to deep learning with convolutional neural networks or transformers. Um, we've all you know, dealt with the question about whether or not AI is really a threat to radiologists. And you know, despite um, lectures that we've gotten um, at ACR um, in this 2016 keynote from Obama um, architect um, Ezekiel Emanuel, who suggested that radiologists may be replaced by computers in the next four or five years. Um, Jeffrey Hinton was a um, professor at the University of Toronto and Google for you, who suggested in 2016 that if you work as a radiologist, you're now like Wiley Coyote should stop training, training radiologists now. And so, you know, I, I think what we've done is we have essentially graduated from, you know, that thinking of that thinking about radiology as a threat. And instead, um, we're thinking increasingly about AI as something that would be able to um, work in tandem with radiologists, not only for image interpretation, but for image optimization and for a wide variety of other tasks that are non-pixel based. So will radiologists be replaced by AI? I think absolutely there's no um, real threat that that will happen anytime in the in the near future. Um, this is from Highlights Magazine, and I think it um, you know demonstrates in an interesting way that although you can have computer algorithms that do a really good job of detecting what's in an image, such as a spoon or a fork, or a TV, these algorithms are still, even in 2023, not able to beat a five-year-old at um, determining what's wrong with these images. And so that extra judgment, um, I think, is something that humans still have um, well over uh, computers at this point. And uh, um, I think that it's going to be quite a while before we have uh, radiologists actually replaced by uh, computers and in image interpretation. And also there are, of course, so many other applications for uh, AI and diagnostic imaging. So in 2011 in June, um, Scientific American actually suggested that perhaps a better test than the Turing test, which asks, can a computer fool a human into thinking that it is a, a human, um, a better test might be um, in, uh, an image suggesting what's wrong with this picture. And so computers, although they can determine what's in an image, the judgment and sort of common sense knowledge um, of what's wrong with an image is much more difficult to, to determine. Um, 
So convolutional neural networks have been applied to a variety of different tasks and uh, being able to essentially have convolutional neural networks be able to um, do analysis of um, images and particular medical images has um, become increasingly in vogue. One thing that's uh, really important is essentially looking at um, how AI methods for evaluating images uh, differ from um, the traditional CAD or handcrafted or radiomics types of approaches. And essentially in this example, for um, taking a look at it, uh, the question is, where's Waldo? And uh, you could <clears throat> write a program, which would be the traditional way to do this, more like we used to do with CAD, to identify Waldo's face and eyeglasses and the shape um, of his hat and the striped shirt. Um, and some of you may have already found Waldo. It's, it's amazing how there are sort of Waldo cognoscenti. If we were writing a computer program to do that, we could essentially identify each object and then run a series of queries and write an algorithm to do that. But um, with um, current approaches with convolutional neural networks, um, it's possible alternatively to be able to train by example. And so being able to take large numbers of images such as these, circle where Waldo is, and then be able to have the computer learn by example without having to write code specifically to um, look for particular features um, has allowed us to be able to democratize and make it significantly faster to be able to develop software that is able to perform a variety of different tasks. Uh, this is actually a false positive uh, a Waldo. Um, this Waldo um, has a sort of a triangular shaped chin and uh, this is actually where, where Waldo was. But um, I think you know the, the point here is that um, it turns out to be much easier and faster if one has a large number of data sets that one can uh, annotate. And so, you know, the implication of deep learning in radiology is that what used to take years to be able to develop with multiple complex steps can now be developed much more rapidly, although it still takes a similar amount of time to be able to uh, test and validate these algorithms. And uh, um, so what we're finding is that there's still a relative bottleneck with regard to um, the tens of thousands of algorithms that exist that have been created for AI and the still relatively small number of algorithms that are available um, commercially and the relatively small number that have been approved um, or cleared by the FDA. So let's talk a little bit about um, AI and medical image reconstruction. Um, so AI is now increasingly being applied for medical image acquisition and optimization. As you all probably know, for MRI, it's being used to decrease um, imaging times, and, and it's been successful um, by um, um, with major reductions in imaging time and actually being able to create higher resolution images in shorter periods of time. Um, it's also been very successful with a PET, with the potential in PET to be able to significantly uh, decrease image acquisition time or decrease noise. And in CT, um, all of the major CT vendors are actively um, implementing uh, AI in their image acquisition and reconstruction um, software. And so here's just an example of an article that was uh, published that uh, inspired the uh, creation of a, of a company that um, is applying AI with deep learning to be able to um, significantly enhance um, PET images to the point where one is able to um, image in a significantly shorter period of time and uh, maintain relatively high quality images. Um, I think in 2023, we're still just scratching the surface. Um, with regard to ability to do noise reduction, ultra low dose scanning, to be able to take lower resolution CT images, which currently are um, typically reconstructed at 512 by 512, and be able to essentially um, upscale the uh, image resolution, um, being able to do artifact reduction, motion reduction, and to be able to significantly speed up 
um, the uh, different forms of iterative reconstruction. Um, with regard to CT reconstruction techniques, um, there's been a really interesting um, evolution. And I think in looking at CT quality and opportunities to improve CT quality, it's really important to look at some of the um, current techniques that are used to reconstruct images in CT and some of their um, challenges and um, advantages and disadvantages. With regard to most CT scanners today, filtered back projection is a technique that's available on all commercial CT scanners and has been um, for many years really the only method of reconstruction. Um, one of the challenges with filtered back projection is it's not particularly efficient at being able to reduce noise and it's um, very, very much dependent on dose more than um, other techniques are. It's not able to, for example, uh, recognize areas of the body that are relatively homogeneous, such as um, fluid within the bladder and doesn't really differentially um, reduce noise in, in those areas. And so because of that, um, it has a number of limitations, including also not being able to recognize areas that demand high frequency um, information, such as the, minor, the inner ear to minimize um, noise reduction. With regard to iterative reconstruction, um, around 2009, 2010, vendors increasingly introduced iterative reconstruction to uh, reduce noise and reduce radiation doses. And iterative reconstruction IR is now routinely available on all CT scanners to reduce noise. It does have a much better capability of being able to quote unquote recognize areas that are relatively homogeneous, such as the bladder and to apply a greater level of noise reduction to those. Unfortunately, um, while it allows reduction of noise that's fairly significant, it also has the effect of reducing resolution. And as importantly, or perhaps more importantly, has a major negative impact on texture. And so you end up getting these images that um, are described as sort of artificial looking or plastic looking. And um, that, destruction of texture information has been a major challenge associated with iterative reconstruction. And so as we've looked at ways to um, reduce dose in CT, um, it, there have been trade-offs with regard to um, image quality, particularly with texture. Texture is something in general that's not measured as a metric of CT scanners when people compare the scanners. And so um, I think that there's been a tendency to lose texture in order to be able to gain um, contrast uh, resolution and to decrease noise. Iterative reconstruction is also really dependent on radiation dose, ironically, because it's been you know, utilized as a radiation dose um, reduction um, technique. And uh, it's also very dependent on object size, object contrast level, and background patient anatomic noise. Um, in addition to statistical-based iterative reconstruction, one can do model-based iterative reconstruction, which is more computationally expensive to the point that it can take many minutes or hours and would be um, impractical for a reconstruction in most um, CT environments. Um, unlike filter back projection, iterative reconstruction uses nonlinear techniques. And so it results in a significant variation in noise reduction throughout an image. Most of the recent literature looking at um, iterative reconstruction um, techniques seem to suggest that the limitation um, in ability to actually reduce dose uh, may be 25%. And um, you know, even at that level, it's not clear what the compromises are with regard to uh, image quality. Um, and so as we Increasingly, are looking at deep learning reconstruction. We're um, we're looking at um, a much more sophisticated and complex uh, mechanisms to be able to um, optimize image quality, um, taking into account a variety of different types of examinations. And so, in theory, deep learning reconstruction can be used to solve a lot of these image reconstruction challenges that we've talked about, including motion artifact, cone beam artifacts, truncation artifacts, and a number of others 
to reduce image noise. Um, and then training of these systems currently has focused much more on noise um, rather than um, other parameters which can impact quality. And so these deep learning algorithms um, add noise um, through simulation and then quote unquote learn how to uh, reduce that noise. And so deep learning algorithms learn how to derive noise texture, spatial resolution, and CT numbers from a, a noisy sinogram to complete to uh, create a clean one. And essentially um, what they do is they um, learn from higher dose images, whether they're um, iterative reconstructed images or filtered back projection images, they learn essentially the characteristics of those images and then are able to um, apply um, what it, they have learned with lower dose images to be able to predict what the higher dose images would have looked like. Um, currently, all commercial vendors are using deep learning with locked weights. Um, which reduces flexibility somewhat, but in the future, it's going to be possible for these deep learning reconstruction algorithms to be able to learn in real time or to make network parameter adjustments that will be personalized to an individual patient. And so the idea of being able to um, adjust the reconstruction on the fly as you're scanning a patient or to be able to get a prior scan on a patient um, offers the potential to really um, have significant improvements in uh, image quality. Um, deep learning um, training itself um, with a, a large number of images is very compute intensive and requires multiple GPUs, large amounts of time and dollars also. But unlike model-based iterative reconstruction, um, once that training is done, it can be implemented at a scanner for really very fast real-time reconstruction. So the training is complex, but at the execution level, at the CT scanner, um, executing um, these parameters um, is very, very rapid. And one can achieve um, dozens of, uh, of images reconstructed per second with most of the uh, deep learning algorithms that are out there commercially. As with other generations of nonlinear reconstruction algorithms, um, it's really difficult to assess performance of deep learning algorithms um, just using classical image quality metrics, such as noise or contrast to noise ratios or signal to noise ratios. Because what's happening is so relatively complex, um, you know, we don't really have um, ideal metrics for determining um, what is the quality of these deep learning algorithms. And also importantly, some of these deep learning algorithms may introduce artifacts in the process of deep learning that may be specific to a certain approach or a particular vendor. And so we're just learning how to be able to recognize limitations of deep learning algorithms also. And so as we look at some of these different algorithms and metrics, um, we're really requiring more advanced um, metrics such as noise power spectrum, which takes texture into account or specific task-based modulation transfer functions and um, other um, observer metrics to be able to more adequately assess deep learning algorithms. Um, but in general, with deep learning, we've been able to achieve relatively um, greater reductions in noise in images where the doses are substantially lower and are less efficient <clears throat> to uh, do iterative reconstruction without the plastic type of appearance associated with IR. And so I think that's the reason that the majority of vendors are venturing into deep learning as their predominant um, me methods for being able to reduce noise and improve image quality. And although the commercially available algorithms are currently um, pretty much all focused on reduction of noise, there are quite a lot of different parameters and different things that deep learning could potentially achieve um, that would be additional improvements beyond just reduction in noise. And so uh, uh, deep learning currently has been shown in a number of physics and clinical studies to be able to be effective at uh, 
um, reducing noise and um, also maintaining relatively uh, high contrast spatial resolution. Um, and they seem to be less prone to degradation at low contrast levels in comparison to iterative reconstruction or um, model-based um, iterative reconstruction. CT number accuracy can also be relatively well preserved with deep learning reconstruction techniques. Um, and of course, the performance varies among different vendors and um, there are all um, things that we're seeing with improvements in contrast to noise ratio, improved noise texture, and improved spatial resolution that um, should ultimately um, be associated with improved subjective ratings by radiologists of image quality. And so um, in general, these deep learning methods assume that a patient's fairly similar in size and attenuation and frequency content to the patients used to train the deep learning model. And that's a really important point, um, similar to the bias that we see with um, algorithms that detect abnormalities or make diagnoses, um, it's really important that the training for these deep learning models um, also um, utilize scans that are similar to the types of scans that are going to be obtained um, in, um, in actual patient um, scanning environments. And so the training set that vendors use um, really, you know, will make the assumption that that training is similar to what is actually happening in the real clinical world. Um, and it's also really important to understand that depending on the type of examination, um, there may be very different requirements for some of these parameters and, and reconstructions. So for example, in CT of the uh, lumbar spine, it may be that you need a very much um, different approach than what you might need in virtual colonoscopy. So one thing that makes things even more complex is the fact that it's um, not only the area of the body that you're looking at, but the particular indication for a study and which portion of a scan one is um, concentrating on. So given all the things that we've learned with deep learning reconstruction and the challenges to make the images as high quality as possible on a number of different parameters, it really raises the question, can we go in the opposite direction and essentially say, can we use AI, on the other hand, to actually assess image quality, whether the image quality is uh, created um, using filter back projection or iterative reconstruction or um, deep learning techniques, can we actually assess um, CT quality? And there have been a, a number of um, articles that have looked at image quality assessment. Um, here's one by uh, Larson et al., Larson and Boland, um, where they essentially looked at image quality control in the era of artificial intelligence. And what they point out, I think very importantly, is that measures have not been developed that directly evaluate the quality of a given image. There are surrogates with image noise and dose estimates but they're not as often utilized and reported as they should be. And they only really tell a relatively small part of the story as far as uh, overall image quality and have limitations in um, essentially determining what a radiologist would subjectively um, uh, read an image as. And so overall, um, individuals and organizations operating the scanners have not really been held responsible for ensuring examinations consistently achieve radiation dose and image quality targets, according to uh, Larson and, and Boland. Um, this is uh, an article by uh, Lee et al., um, including uh, Mary Ellen Geiger, that um, looked at assessment of quality of CT um, of the lungs using deep learning. And so, one of the things that was really fascinating here was the idea of being able to have a radiologist um, assess quality of images and then be able to take the pixel-based data from CT scans of the chest and um, have the computer trained to be able to predict um, for these 74 cases um, in patients with interstitial lung disease 
what were the characteristics or, or, or more specifically, which were the examinations that would be rated as acceptable in comparison to ones that were not acceptable. And so this is the first paper that I'm aware of that looked at AI to be able to make judgments. Of course, there were limitations. This is only 74 cases. There was only one radiologist and it was a specific indication um, for um, assessment for interstitial lung disease. And so, you know, one question is, would it be possible to broaden this to multiple different types of CT scans and assessments? And, you know, how, how might one um, accomplish that? And, you know, the, the whole idea of being able to um, assess quality of imaging has, you know, been developed in other modalities other than CT. Um, this is actually a, a list from the uh, FDA of uh, approved algorithms that's on the uh, ACR site from the uh, ACR Data Science Institute. And if you do a search by quality, what you really find are algorithms that are looking at taking a, C, a, a data set and improving the quality of the um, image, but not really assessment. And so it it's questionable, and it may be that algorithms that actually determine quality may not need to be uh, FDA cleared, but there are very few instances out there. Um, here's a paper that was uh, um, written looking at um, AI-based quality assessment in CT to analyze whether or not the correct body parts <clears throat> were included on the study and whether IV contrast or oral contrast was administered automatically. Here's AI for the assessment of infant hip ultrasound quality, and um, here's deep learning um, for assessment of a uh, whole heart um, MR images uh, to be able to essentially try and create a metric for uh, quality of uh, MR images of the, uh, of the heart. Also, uh, there's um, commercial software that's available for assessing quality of mammography. Um, it's been demonstrated for mammography that um, low quality images are associated with a two and a half fold increased risk of uh, missing cancer on <clears throat> what were deemed to be low quality images. And you know, research suggests even expert readers have a varying interpretation of image quality. And so um, there are quite a variety of different reasons associated with varying estimates of, of image quality. And uh, so software has been um, created to provide feedback to technologists and radiologists with regard to positioning for mammography and with regard to overall image quality and mammography. We don't really have an analogous set of software for, uh, for CT. Um, and so- um, uh, Dr. Have, Siegel, yes. I'm, just chiming, I'm just chiming in with a noise, uh, time check here. Uh, there's a question or two waiting in the Q&A. So um, you yes. can respond to those in writing or wrap up the talk sooner and, and leave a couple minutes to get to the questions. Yeah, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to try and wrap okay. up in the next three minutes or so awesome. and, next, and then see if I can take those couple questions. Great. So all this has kind of been building up to the idea of um, a, a study that uh, Dr. Smith Beinman um, was the uh, PI on, where uh, um, rather than just the one radiologist, um, the study was essentially um, created to try to identify if a given CT scan is essentially appropriate and falls within a routine high or um, low dose um, screening, so different types of examinations. And the question was to determine um, whether or not an examination was acceptable and whether it needed to be repeated or not. And part of this was associated with a program with CMS to try and ascertain whether or not they could create an incentive for reducing dose but have an objective metric to be able to determine while dose was decreased, whether or not there was any compromise in image quality associated with it. And so in the study that Dr. Smith Beinman did, there were tens of thousands of ratings of, I think it was 734 CT examinations by 125 radiologists in the largest study of its kind. 
using ratings of excellent, adequate, marginally acceptable, um, or poor. And uh, so we essentially had multiple ways to look at noise, uh, noise um, determined by segmenting the air outside the patient, noise within the image um, as judged by a variety of physics parameters um, developed by uh, uh, Dr. Sami and his colleagues at Duke. And then we also used a technique similar to what Mary Ellen Geiger used, where we actually um, had the AI systems assess the pixel-based information. And the study really documented fairly wide variability among radiologists with every case um, rated by, I think at least that it was um, 25 or 30 or more radiologists. The results of the study um, essentially are being submitted for publication, but I think the bottom line is, is that um, in general, there was a fair amount of variability that some of the multi-parametric physics estimates seem to be better than just using image noise, but that um, it is still a challenge to predict, um, probably partly because of the wide variability in radiologist subjective scoring, but that overall pixel-based AI techniques were relatively similar in performance to the physics-based AI techniques and also looking at overall uh, image noise. And so what would I like to see in the future? Well, I'd like to see something that is developed where we have objective ways to be able to provide feedback to uh, technologists. I'd like to be able to um, use um, techniques such as the just noticeable difference where we could take a patient's prior scan and simulate what it would look like at lower dose levels using the JND metric and to have potentially a slider that might allow one to be able to assess for what would be optimal dose. And so that would be a human related mechanism for determining dose. And I think being able to have AI related mechanisms that are analogous to what's used for reconstruction could really play a major positive role in allowing us overall to uh, reduce um, doses for patients. And so um, in conclusion, I think AI is promising and can predict radiologist judgments overall better than individual radiologists based on the study that Dr. smith Feynman um, was PI on. And um, AI could serve as a tool to help determine the amount of time or radiation for image acquisition. It could also be used to essentially take a prior study and then use that to optimize protocols for today's study. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop there and thank you all very much for the opportunity to sort of give this um, whirlwind uh, overview and happy to take those couple questions. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Siegel. That was fascinating. Um, we have two questions in the Q&A. Hopefully we can get to both of them. Um, <clears throat> really great practical question from Priscilla. What oversights are in place uh, for AI? <clears throat> And how are reading errors detected? Yeah, so um, those are two huge questions. As far as oversights for AI, there are very little oversights now for AI for um, image quality um, assessment, um, but in particular for a, a deep learning reconstruction. And uh, as far as how one determines about um, errors in image interpretation, um, that can be very difficult because there's a variety of different opinions by different radiologists and it's hard to have a gold standard. And so I think the challenge that we have is even if we could have quality assessment, it may vary according to whether it's a neuro study, chest study, body study, et cetera. And in uh, Dr. smith um, uh study, it essentially differentiated among those. And so um, it can be extraordinarily difficult to determine accuracy rates of radiologists without having large numbers of radiologists or multiple radiologists interpreting a study and then having on um, that standard. And so I think the challenge is that it's difficult to adjust and to determine quality based on reader performance and missed findings. And so that's why I think we need to use other parameters to try and optimize image quality, which makes this such a challenging task. So thanks for that question. And you said there was another one? Um, yes, and another one came in, but I, we might have to get to that one in writing. Uh, the okay, second sure. question was, was, what role do you see GPT-4 playing in radiology? 
Yeah, so I think GPT-4 is going to play a huge role in radiology. GPT-4 has the potential to be able to help us generate reports more rapidly. GPT-4 has the potential to um, allow us to minimize contradictions within a radiology report. It allows us to be able to uh, take findings and to generate a report associated with it. We can translate reports into different languages. GPT-4 also could potentially read and review reports and synthesize what's important. And one project I'm super interested in and has worked on with IBM since 2011 is being able to read a patient's chart, synthesize what's important in the patient's chart and history in a way that would be impractical to do with every case, and then be able to present um, in a context-based way what's important for a radiologist to know beyond the limited history that we get. So I really think there are dozens of amazing applications um, you know, associated with these um, uh, pre-trained uh, generative uh, uh, models and the transformers technology. And I'm really excited about those moving forward. And I think transformers are going to play a role in image reconstruction and in image quality assessment too. Great. Um, well, we're not too far over time, so we'll just take the last question. Can you explain how in-air noise measurements correlate with perceived image quality? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. And the, the challenge in trying to determine noise in an image is where in an image do you measure? Do you measure in a homogeneous area, maybe over the liver or over the bladder or gallbladder? Or do you measure over the lungs, which can vary? And so you know, part of, you know, one approach, which is really fascinating, is to say, well, the air outside of a patient should be fairly homogeneous. And so to be able to utilize that in being able to try and create sort of a metric for overall noise in an image. And so that was the rationale. I think in general, that correlates fairly well with some of the more sophisticated techniques that have picked particular areas of an image to try and to determine noise. But of course, noise varies across an image from one sequence to the other, from one image to the other. But I found it fascinating how relatively well and how relatively simple the assessment of noise was by just essentially creating regions of interest and then looking at standard deviations and maybe even doing power spectra, looking at the noise of the air outside the patient. So thanks for letting me clarify that.